Hello, everyone. Welcome to the 2023 Hot Topics in Environmental Law Summer Lecture Series. I'm Jenny Rushlow, Dean of the Vermont School for the Environment, and we're very pleased to welcome you to the presentation today. Each of these talks is worth one CLE credit in Vermont. So if you plan to claim that credit, just keep track of any talks you attend in this series for your records. We will have time for Q&A after the presentation today. If you're watching on the VLGS YouTube or Facebook channels, you can enter your questions in the chat or the comment space at any time, and we'll get through as many as we can. Um, and I'll collect those to uh, ask questions after the presentation, but you can enter your questions throughout the talk at any point. Today, we're very pleased to welcome as our speaker, Professor Angela Fernandez. Professor Fernandez is a professor with the Faculty of Law and Department of History at the University of Toronto. She is a member of the Scholars Committee of the Brooks Institute for Animal Rights, Law and Policy, as well as the Collaborative Research Network, the Brooks Animal Studies Academic Network. She also sits on the Board of Advisors and is a Director of Animal Justice Canada. And she's also a fellow with the Oxford Center for Animal Ethics. She teaches Animals in the Law, a Legal History Seminar and Contracts. And under Professor Fernandez's leadership, the University of Toronto is partnering with the Brooks Institute of Animal Rights Law and Policy to publish the Canadian Animal Law Digest, which is a free twice a month update on developments in Canadian animal law. Um, Professor Fernandez also works with the Bora Alaskan Law, law Library on updating the Animal Law Research Guide, which was launched in March 2022. She holds degrees from McGill University, Queen's University, and Yale Law School. This summer, Professor Fernandez joins us as the VLGS Distinguished Animal Law Summer Scholar. And today her presentation is titled, Animals as Property, Quasi-Property, or Quasi-Person. Please join me in welcoming Professor Angela Fernandez. Thank you so much, Jenny. And um, I'm so honored to be uh, the inaugural Distinguished Animal Law Scholar um, in the Animal Law and Policy Program. It's wonderful to be here. And I wanna thank uh, Delcy Winders, uh, Laura Ireland and Laura Fox for their um, wonderful hospitality so far. The visit has been really um, terrific. So the proposal that I'm talking about with you today grows out of a frustration, which I think um, many people share with the binary choice that we're usually presented with when we're talking about the legal classification for non-human animals. So really, we're usually being told that we've got two options here, either a property classification or personhood. So legal scholars like Gary Francione has been emphasizing the property status of non-human animals um, for quite a long time now, um, since his book was published in the 1990s. And legal activists like Stephen Wise and the Non-Human Rights Project have been pushing for legal personhood. It must be said, without a great deal of success beyond um, encouraging dissent, some encouraging dissents which are important, um, but um, that pathway looks um, uh, like a difficult one. The proposal that I am presenting here, quasi-property, quasi-personhood, is a way um, to um, move forward to capture what is true about both of these perspectives when it comes to animals and their status, um, their legal status. The idea is that non-human animals are some species of property and they are also persons in the sense that they have rights, some rights, inadequate rights, uh, generally speaking, or perhaps universally speaking, um, but uh, they are um, on, they're on both sides of that uh, divide. Um, it might be thought to be a bit of a strange way to push forward beyond the property persons divide to actually employ the terms themselves and to use them themselves. Uh, however, I'm starting from a very practical, pragmatic motive in doing this, um, in a way really beginning from inside the law. Uh, why? Well, these are both categories um, that the law currently recognizes and judges and other legal actors will also recognize um, them and be willing to agree um, potentially that they do both apply to non-human animals. 
I want to say three important things at the outset of the talk, uh, just to kind of um, clear the ground a little bit. Uh, one is to say that this idea of quasi-property, quasi-person is really uh, intended to be a minimum floor rather than a ceiling. So I think that that's very important to think about. This is not like necessarily the ideal angle, but really um, a way of uh, starting starting in a productive way that gets us that gets us um, beyond the usual dichotomy. That's the first point. Then the second point is in terms of content of the legal rights, it's really very important that um, they are that's going to grow over time. So, you know, what you would currently be able to kind of slot into quasi property or quasi person in terms of protections, those are not static, they're not fixed. It really is something that um, would hopefully get better uh, as uh, we move forward. And then the third thing to note in terms of ground clearing here is really that as a proposal, it's really it's both a descriptive proposal as well as a normative proposal. So it's describing um, what the status is now to some extent, um, that, that is true of what it would currently exist, but it's also normative in the sense that we could um, and should maybe adopt it and then be able to move forward with it and fill it up with better content than currently exists. So that's the sense in which I mean it's both uh, descriptive and, and normative. Okay, so I want to start here um, by quoting from a book I recently read by Benedict Boisseron called Afro Dog, Blackness and the Animal Question. It's an excellent book. And one of the things that Professor Boisseron says in here is um, she calls it the human paradox. To struggle with the knowledge that humans are not like things, but have the continual practice of treating them as such in spite of that knowledge. So, you know, this is not, um, you know, a, a narrow claim. This is, this is a broad claim about a really deep contradiction that exists just in human, um, human life human, and human thinking. The person's thing uh, divide is very fundamental to law. As many people know, it comes from Roman law. Uh, it has um, been an extremely influential class classificatory approach for law. Um, so, for instance, in civil law jurisdictions, the first book, the civil code, is always the book called the law of persons, and persons is set out, and then you get things, and then the third part of the triad, it comes from Gaius and Roman law, is actions. Um, but part of the reason why we've inherited the dichotomy in the way that we have has to do with this Roman law classification. Civil law, which is directly coming from Roman law, divides things into those who move and um, those which don't. So it's usually called movables or immovables. And immovables in common law are um, like that's real estate, basically. So it's the, it's the personal property, um, real property divide as well. Now, in civil law, there's a further division amongst movables between those um, things moving under their own power and those that you pick up and move. So, you know, in French, this is usually called meuble, like furniture. That would be, you know, like, so you like pick the chair up and you move it as opposed to a non-human animal, which is going to move um, on its own, on its own steam, on its own power. In common law, we usually call that a fugitive resource because usually we're talking about it from a resource perspective. Um, at least that's the term um, that, that Blackstone used. Okay, um, now um, this is important. Why? Well, because the rule for ownership of wild animals is the same in common law and civil law. It comes from this idea of the inherently fugitive kind of nature of um, animals moving um, on their own, at least for wild animals. Uh, why do we have this rule? It's called the rule of capture. The idea is that um, you need to have a rule that says the animal has to be really subdued completely, either killed or contained in a way that it can't escape, um, uh, that, that, is, that that's uh, what's required. And if, it, if that doesn't happen, then they're going to go back into the common, the common property. Now, in the U.S., this rule, the capture rule, was set down in a famous or probably I should say infamous fox hunting case called Pearson and Post. 
Um, this case, um, which those of you who are coming from a law background will remember from property, um, this um, I wrote a book about this case in uh, a number of years ago now, using a style of legal scholarship and legal history called legal archaeology, which I'm very happy to talk about more about in the in the Q and A. Um, but that's why, for me, the capture rule is such an important rule because I spent so long working on this case, and in fact, it was my entry way and my entry point into animal law. I had been a law professor for about a decade before I started doing animal law. And it was really through the historical scholarship on the Pearson case that uh, that, that came about. I continued to think about this case and the capture rule it laid down because there is something that is very still true about the classification of non-human animals as a form of self-moving property, even if this classification makes life very dangerous for them. Okay, and here for wild animals, obviously the danger is in being hunted and being um, you know, captured and killed or captured so that you can't escape. There's a short step then to domesticated animals who are owned um, and you know, they're, they're, they're treated differently. So the distinction between wild and domestic is, is you know, goes back as old as these, all these other ones. Um, but you might think of domesticated animals as being the ones who are um, owned, and at least in our current factory farm system, they're being treated as if they do not move, like we're pretending that they don't move, um, thereby uh, triggering the paradox um, that Professor Breswam was talking about in terms of knowing that they're sentient and they shouldn't be treated like this, but yet continuing to treat them like that. Uh, for animal protection, the reaction then is you know, at the very least to try to get a bit more space for animals so that they can move, turn around, spread their wings or their limbs. And this basic idea, as many of you know, has been recently accepted in the Supreme Court of the U.S. case upholding Proposition 12 on um, minimum space requirements for pigs. So this is an idea that um, I think, um, you know, even in if even in, in this milieu and spaces where you think it wouldn't be very animal protection friendly, um, there is a there is some recognition here that um, this is just this is just true um, and needs to be and needs to be acknowledged as paradoxical as it continues to be and, and remains. Um, Property then is, as Francione emphasized um, in his book um, from the 90s, it's this very dangerous place for non-human animals to be. And the reason I think, you know, he put his finger on, which is very true and very um, important and still resonates very much, is that um, why is this dangerous for them? It's dangerous for them because it's so very easy to trade, their, trade off their interests for even non-trivial human interests. So instrumentalizing them in some way, um, obviously specifically eating them um, um, is going to be very significant because of the numbers of animals that that puts in that danger uh, zone. Okay, so there are a lot of ways then um, in which the law actually does recognize that non-human animals are not mere, mere things. So at the very least, they are a form of sentient property with biological needs, as it's sometimes put in some um, legislative um, acknowledgments. Um, and so um, th this, is, this, is, uh, this is significant. And we can see it operating for both companion animals, um, that kind of domesticated animal, as well as um, for wild animals. So I'll talk a little bit about both of those. Okay, so for companion animals, we see a lot of acknowledgements in the law that non-human animals are not mere things, that they are some kind of special form of property, sentient property. Why? Well, we see that um, they can be the subject of trust um, in most jurisdictions. They can have their best interests taken into account when it comes to custody and divorce. And that is still not, not common, but um, there are some places and some jurisdictions where that's being done. Um, they're also for damage awards where uh, non-human animals are killed or in, injured, <clears throat> giving an amount of money that exceeds the market value of the animal is a recognition that uh, there is something here that is more than mere property. Um, also, we have acknowledgements like domestic violence shelters where 
people are allowed to bring, women are allowed to bring their non-human animal or dog or their cat in the shelter with them where they would otherwise be not permitted to bring in other forms of property. So it's like there's a, there's a recognition that this is not ordinary property. Some jurisdictions are increasingly recognizing the victim status of non-human animals in um, criminal proceedings. And so we have, and people kind of disagree about how progressive that is, but you know, generally speaking, you might look at this collection of um, uh, acknowledgements and say, hey, look, there really are some progressive developments here in animal law that are recognizing we have something on our hands that we're legally recognizing is not just ordinary property, that it's sentient property or not mere property. Uh, for wild animals, this is um, a little bit different, um, but as many of you probably know, uh, wild animals will be nominally owned by the state, and then the private ownership is going to potentially follow with the capture rule. Okay, but that capture rule has always kind of been talked about as um, giving people a qualified form of ownership. And it's qualified because of this uh, escape possibility. The, the escape possibility is always there. And so um, in another way of putting it in more like fancy theoretical terms would be to say it's a defeasible, it's defeasible. So um, it's that kind of um, it's that kind of a right or an, or an interest defeasible upon escape. And so then arguably it is also a, a form of, of quasi ownership. And here, you know, I'm using the word quasi to mean, um, you know, something that is um, resembling but is different than, or you might think of it as semi or mixed or or something like that. And you know, in addition to obviously property and person being very well accepted, very well known in terms of um, you know legal categories or legal terminology, quasi is also got something of that status too. It could be, you know, some people might say it's like the last refuge of a scoundrel because you're sort of saying it's neither nor, but it's something that lawyers often resort to when they're um, trying to classify something that is actually just really kind of difficult to classify, like something that's quasi-administrative or quasi-legislative or quasi-contractual or, um, you know, there's um, there's lots and lots of examples of this. Okay, so quasi property in the sense that you have this um, similarity or resemblance to regular movable property, but a difference in terms of moral um, treatment and legal and legal treatment. So at the very least, uh, non-human animals would be quasi property. Now, on the personhood side, I would join a number of other scholars in pointing out um, the basic idea that non-human animals <clears throat> already have rights. These are welfare rights, usually, in many jurisdictions. And <clears throat> I was recently reading Raphael Faisal and Sean Butler's book, Animal Rights Law, and I uh, would highly recommend that book to anyone. It's really very, very good overview and survey of things. And I know that they were here recently at Vermont just a couple of weeks ago. And so uh, likely there might be some people in the audience who uh, were part of the, the um, group who were discussing the book. Um, but one of the things that they point out very early on in that book is that at least as of 2021, um, you've got at least 152 out of 193 UN member states who have some form of animal protection. So that's 79%. So what we're talking about is, you know, a pretty large number of jurisdictions who are in some way recognizing this idea that we, animals are not, can't be just treated as um, regular property. Okay, and um, these this protection could be either criminal law, prohibitions on cruelty, usually that's an, uh, framed in terms of unnecessary cruelty, and then you could also have prohibitions on causing distress. That's how we do it in Canada anyway. We have a federal um, unnecessary cruelty provision in the criminal code, and then we have provincial statutes that are um, uh, preventing um, uh, distress from being caused to an animal. Okay, these are usually referred to collectively as welfare rights, and they are very basic protections. Uh, Saskia Stuckey calls them simple rights as opposed to fundamental rights. Fazel and Butler call them thin rights as opposed to thick rights. 
as a historian, when I've talked about this, I tend to kind of frame things in, in historical terms. So I look at the simple rights as being more like 19th century rights versus what we might think of as 20, 20th century and 20 or 21st century demands for more um, fundamental protections, like what the um, Non-Human Rights Project is asking for. Now, um, for the fundamental or the thick rights, these aren't absolute. And it is important to kind of uh, keep that in mind. And even when compared against human rights, which are also are not absolute, but the idea is that they are um, not easily infringible in that way that Francion warned about. You can't easily trade them off. And both um, us, um, Saskia Stuckey and Anna Peters have um, emphasized this point in their discussions about what kind of rights we're talking about. Faisal and Butler have a similar sort of framework. And for them, they say that really those fundamental thick rights just actually don't exist yet in any jurisdiction. So what we're talking about are the thin welfare rights, really. Um, and those are the, that's sort of as good as it as it gets um, for the moment, with the exception of some um, more um, uh, interesting innovations that have happened in, in other jurisdictions. But um, we can leave it at that uh, for the moment. OK, welfare rights are by no means adequate. They are, as we all know, under enforced, they can't be privately enforced or brought in the animal's own name. Um, and so that's a problem. Um, but non-human animals, this, this view, as this view goes, they must be legal persons already of some kind to have even those kinds of rights. So the idea is asking for recognition of something like personhood, even if you're not gonna call it personhood, something like personhood is not stepping so far outside of what is actually already happening. Okay, um, and again, paradoxically, you know, in the sense that we're doing it, but we're not really recognizing or letting that, letting that insight flow back into what we call an unhuman animals at the end of the day. We just say, oh, well, they're property, they're not persons, but it's not taking into account these other things that are going on. Um, as to the pragmatic or practical point here, it might be too much to ask judges, legislatures, or members of the public even to, to acknowledge that non-human animals are persons with rights, um, it's still probably pretty the predominant position that people feel very uncomfortable about that. They want to maintain a line between humans and other animals. But what we might be able to do at least is um, get the acknowledgement that there is at least some form of quasi personhood here. So, you know, non human animals have more than the mere thing status on the one hand. But what they have on the personhood side is probably less than full person, at least in the human being sense of person. But it's something that is enough to say that they're the legal entity that can, can that can bear rights. And right now, those rights are not very good, but they are capable of being made more meaningful or more robust or more fundamental or, or more thick, um, however you, know, you want to call that. Okay, so I would then um, talk, uh, want to talk a little bit now about just sort of some criticisms of the view and then some positive uh, things that can be said about it um, prior to opening it up for people to respond to and, um, and talk about. So in terms of criticisms, I think, um, you know, probably the biggest one is that quasi-property, quasi-personhood is consistent with the status quo. And in that sense, it doesn't inherently in and of itself push for better protections or for better content in terms of the rights. So that's um, one um, downside. Another one is that it seems it will probably work better for some animals rather than others. So companion animals, um, I think, or wild animals that are more the charismatic wild animals, like primates, elephants, and orcas. So kind of with the same limitation that the non-human rights approach has. Um, so it's, yeah, it's going to naturally kind of lend itself probably to working better for some animals than others. 
And this is another criticism that I recently have been thinking about because it came up um, when I presented this topic um, at a previous uh, group. And someone in the audience asked me, how good is it to be quasi anything? You know, like if you're going for personhood, you only get quasi personhood. It's like, you know, quasi quasi wouldn't be very, very good for anything. And I think the response, partially, so partial response to that is to say, well, at least for property, it waters down the property category in that sense. It is better, quasi, you know, quasi is better on that side, actually. Um, and so, um, you know, there's um, there's a bit of that trade-off going on. Um, in terms of other pros, I think the idea um, that's, you know, probably a good one is that you have something that's politically a lot more palatable than personhood is. Um, secondly, it actually fits what does currently exist. And so it's, it's, it's sort of like an it's like a, it's accurate or true, at least as a redescription. It's a bit of an unfamiliar redescription, but it's, it is really a redescription based on um, what's already there. Uh, thirdly, and very importantly, um, it can be used to get better rights, um, to grow, as it were, more uh, fundamental or thick rights, and for that to kind of work in lockstep with what's happening socially and culturally. Okay, so um, with the rise of veganism, um, again, also, I think very importantly, um, the awareness of the connection between animal agriculture and um, plant-based eating, we're going to potentially see some changes here. And I think as a historian, I really take very seriously the humbleness of this kind of idea that we just like really don't really know what's going to happen and things could start to move in a much more positive direction than um, they currently are, are pretty stuck. So that um, that is that is hopeful. And I think that environmental awareness piece is very, very important. And people in the audience here um, will have a lot of background knowledge on that and um, probably sense of what's happening there. I would just mention on this that um, in Vancouver right now, uh, they did a survey on plant-based eating, and they noted that while um, health was number one concern, environment, um, animals on there, pretty high up, but um, one of the highest, I think it was after health, is cost awareness. So as, you know, we've got, you know, such high inf uh, inflation and cost of living and food prices going up so high that this could be something that's really going to push people um, away from more uh, away from animal um, animal agriculture animals. And um, if that's the case, then we just could have an, a, a natural growing and an evolution. And the idea is the law would be kind of ready to, you know, work with that um, as that as, as that happens. Okay. Um, and then the last point, I think, in terms of pros is just to emphasize the way in which the idea of quasi property quasi prison is kind of awkward. It's a little clunky. I sometimes call it quasi hood just to just make it a bit shorter. But basically, it, you know, it's, I think, also very important to think that, you know, we need to get beyond using binaries um, for lots of things, this kind of either or thinking that is generally very limiting. And we know right now for gender identity, for instance, is very much um, at the forefront of our awareness that um, using those binary categories is often um, really problematic. And it's something that we kind of got to get used to that there's, that there's, there are these, there are these quasi mixed um, uh, categories that are just more true to, um, to, re to reality. Um, and even if they're not as neat. Okay, um, so animal law, then I would say, especially um, in the US, has been trapped in a lot of binary thinking, uh, property versus persons, and also um, welfare uh, versus rights, which um, we could uh, have a whole nother lecture on that topic. Um, but I think it's very important to try to move beyond these uh, binaries while at the same time recognizing that we can't leave them completely behind, or we could, um, but that is gonna be more difficult to do. And it might be more practical to try to work with what is familiar in the legal system um, and what is already um, juridically recognizable. So I think, um, Jenny, I, I'll, I'll leave it with that if we want to uh, start opening it up and seeing how people are reacting. <laughs>
Great, thank you. Um, so as a reminder to folks, if you'd like to submit questions, um, you just do it in the chat on the, on the viewing platform that you're using. So whether it's Facebook or YouTube, um, just put a question in the chat or the comment space and we'll get through as many as we can. <clears throat> I'll start things off. I You mentioned um, early on that you could talk more about the concept of legal archeology. span uh, And so I wanted to just take an opportunity for you to do that. It sounds really interesting. Yeah, yeah, thanks for asking that, Jenny. So I do, a, I teach a course at U of T called Legal Archaeology, Cases in Context. And one of the things we do is investigate that form of legal scholarship and really, um, but I always say to people, it doesn't involve any digging. So <laughs> like, there's no, we're not going to go out on any field trips and dig. <laughs> there's no real archaeology is going to be going on. But what we're basically kind of doing is starting with the premise that any legal case is really what you're reading in your case book is just like the tip of the iceberg. And then underneath the water, there's all this other stuff that happens that, you know, if you really want to understand the case and why it happened and what its what its significance was at the time, you got to really dig. And so it's like the lawyers, the place where it happened, that kind of thing. And with the Pearson book, what I did was I tried to have like three kind of um, almost like holes, I guess, that I was digging. So like the first hole was basically the social history around like that local stuff with the case. And then like, what were the two families really fighting about that kind of thing? And then the second hole was about um, this, what I called um, a, a law and literature approach, because one of the things that became very obvious once I started working with that decision was there was a lot of humor in the dissent. And if you remember reading it, I mean, that, and that's part of why I think it still gets put in case books and people still read it is because there's this very humorous dissent. And I'm trying to kind of understand, well, like, like why do people, like why, like, why do animals lend themselves so easily to that? And I think it's still true. You know, in media, you see that people make jokes, oh, these chickens, the truck was hit and the chickens were on well and the police put out a tweet saying why did the chickens cross the road or whatever like you know they 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 wouldn't do that if that was an accident involving humans right like so there's this idea that there's a permission to make fun and so I call that um legal solemn foolery and I, I try to give a bunch of different examples historically and contemporary of courts doing that um and uh, and then the third hole there that I was digging was about how the case kind of came down to us and got in the case books. So sort of looking at how that um, was working and what that precedent was doing for treatise writers and for, um, you know, and then eventually in the 80s, how law and economics people liked it because it was a good case about, um, you know, clear lines, capture versus fuzzy standards, hot pursuit. And it's just sort of been um, gone through many different incarnations and carried lots of different sort of, it's not like audiological, but, but, but just, just different resonances and meanings over, over the years, over the 200 plus years now. It kind of reminds me that the idea of um, legal archaeology kind of reminds me uh, at least how I have gone about preparing for oral argument. Because when you're, you know, when you're doing research for a static document, like a, a brief in a case, there's sort of, you know, a certain, a certain depth that you go, I think. But when you know you're going to be in front of judges who could ask you literally anything they could think of related to a case that you've cited or, or some other case that you haven't cited, you really have to like dig, follow, dig as deep as you can find any thread that could come up um, that doesn't, I think, get as much into the cultural pieces that you talked about, but it's a, it's an important skill as a lawyer um, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. something that, that you have to, you have to learn to do. Yes. Um, yes. And okay. AJ, you probably have to know when to stop too, which is like, yeah. <laughs> which yeah. I, for me, I, 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 I stop I, when I've run out of time. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> You can fill the time with digging until until you can't. Until you can't. <laughs> yeah. Okay. We have we have some questions. So uh, from Professor Winders, um, as someone who spent a few years paralyzed by Gary, is it Francione? Yeah, I think people. Some people say Francione, but but I think either word is, is okay. okay. As I've heard both. 
So paralyzed by Gary Francioni's analysis early in my career, I so appreciate your approach. Do you have thoughts on particular jurisdictions that might be doing a better job of ascribing a more nuanced legal status for non-human animals? It seems like countries like Canada and the US are behind in this area. Do you agree? And if so, why do you think that is? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Delcy, thanks so much for that question. I, I think it's right to put Canada generally in with the US in terms of being behind, for sure. Although the one exception is that in Quebec, we have now since 2015 there a not things provision, which is basically following France and some of the other European jurisdictions who are putting not things into their civil codes. So, you know, how I was mentioning in a civil code country, you'll have persons, then you'll have things or property. And basically, so the recognition for um, sentience, it's still in the property section, still in the things section. So they're still saying it's property and property rules apply. But there's a statement like non-human animals are sentient beings with biological needs. That's what the Quebec one reads. And it's 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 modeled basically on the French one. They did it right after France did theirs. And so I think that those jurisdictions are moving ahead with this more nuanced idea. Um, and so France would be in step then with like Germany um, has um, this uh, not things or I'm, I'm not sure Austria for sure has it. I'm pretty sure Germany also has it. And then there are a couple other European jurisdictions that have it. So I sort of think that in the US and in Canada, it's good for like in, in common law Canada, it's good for us to be looking at those other jurisdictions to sort of see like, hey, this is possible, you know, and it's not quite as polarized. I don't know what it is. There's something about like, you know, I don't know. It's like the global, the, 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 I don't, Canada and the US, because we are so influenced by the US. So that's kind of, we're kind of following, I don't want to blame you guys, but, but we're, but, you know, we're kind of just following along, I think, in a lot, at least theoretical for theoretical things. And we're not like really taking in, like, hey, there's stuff here that's happening that's changing. And at a certain point, you might want to take those changes and kind of tally them up and use them to say, hey, we could start talking differently about this. And probably more importantly, we can use that to get to the next, whatever the next thing is, you know, whatever the next improvement would be, instead of kind of feeling like, oh, God, like, what's the point? They're just property. They're always going to be property. There's, you know, and, and so that's sort of my, my thinking on that. But, but I don't really know. I don't really know why. I don't, I don't know. You can blame us. That's okay. <laughs> <laughs> um okay. okay another question have you drafted or are you otherwise aware of model legislation embodying your view of the optimum yeah so as far as i know there's not no like actual implementation kind of uptake like that i mean um in the justice the horse case the first time round, the amicus curiae brief we tried to put this um, view in there along with a couple other views to see whether um, the court would uh take that and um they didn't and then you know upon now the, the subsequent appeals um that's been a pretty negative result in terms of like that basic idea that i talked about which is animals have rights because they actually just already do have some rights they didn't even seem to be able to accept that as a proposition so that's uh very discouraging for sure um in terms of legislative uh there's nothing that I have, I know of. The only thing that ha that did happen was in March, the Senate in Canada did refer to um, the um, the paper that I published with this idea on the Brooks um, Animal Rights Law and Policy website, uh, and not specifically the quasi idea, but more this idea of property or persons dominating the debate for the last thirty five years or so, and um, but unfortunately, it was a conservative critic, and so I don't think he was. <laughs> I don't know, it wasn't being, it wasn't being invoked to be recommended. It was sort of being invoked to be like, oh, you know, people are pushing for personhood and that's scary. And that's going to mean all these calamities and that kind of slippery slope type of an idea. That was what the rest of the speech went on to talk about. So 
Um, I was, I was, it was being used in, as part of that, which is maybe not great. Although people tell me that's, that's a compliment of a sort, but, um, <laughs> but, but yeah, but nothing is, you know, at least so far anyway, that has, is really um, putting it in specifically. Okay. Um, I know we have a bunch of law professors listening, watching. So I wondered as someone who teaches contracts, if you could talk about, you know, do you incorporate animal law into your contracts class? And do you have any um, suggestions or visions for how animal law should be incorporated into core curriculum in law school? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, that's a great question. Yeah, so I would say for contracts is hard and I haven't really figured out how to do it with contracts. Although I do introduce the legal archeology span method to them because there's been a lot of uh, contract cases that have been done like this. So I sort of kind of get them introduced to that idea. And then if they do the upper year seminar, then we get into the kind of animal examples of it. I'm, I'm working on another book right now that talks about the Pearson decision in a Canadian context later. It's a fishing case. And probably when I teach that course this year, I'll be able to, 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 to get them to, to think about that work and read that. So that should be good. But in terms of like more generalizable things that people could try to do, one thing is that um, I'm not teaching this course anymore, but I was for a while teaching um, an introduction to civil procedure course. And there I thought that was very useful for animal um, content because, you know, we have to do a standing section. And so I would include some of the issues there relating to, to non human And standing for us is not as... Um, like it's not as technical as it is in the US. So it's a little bit more, it's a little bit more straightforward. We have this test that's pretty straightforward. And we have a case involving um, an elephant in Edmonton where the judge, the, one of the judges in dissent, the chief justice there wrote this really long dissent talking about the value of um, Lucy the elephant from the, from an animal rights perspective. So we get into that and then what sometimes happens is the students who are in that class, because it's first year, then they'll take animal law in either second year or third year. So like I always try and go around the class at the start of animal law and ask like, what brought you here? And there are always a bunch of people who say, oh, it's Lucy, you know, and what they learned about her, so. Great, thank you. Um, you mentioned at the beginning of the talk that you'd been a lawyer. I think you said a law professor for like 10 years before you got into animal law. Um, I know you have an LLM. Was that part of your transition? Oh, yeah. So the LLM actually came like right after I, I, I did my law degrees in McGill and Montreal. And then I clerked for the Supreme Court in Ottawa. And then I went to Yale and did the LLM there. Mm -hmm. And then I started the doctoral program, but I didn't finish it because this job came up at Toronto. So I just kind of like grabbed the job and then had this dissertation that I was trying to finish for a long time when I was teaching at U of T. So that was, that was kind of challenging. But so all that time I was really just, you know, doing my usual topics, like really it was legal history topics. And mm -hmm. I had my dissertation was on um, uh, legal education, different, different forms of legal education. And so, um, yeah, so really it was just, I, 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 and if you'd asked me like in those 10 years, what do you think about animals? I would have said, well, I mean, there must be laws and I'm sure it's protected and it's probably fine. You know, I really had an extremely naive perspective on it if I had ever really thought about it at all. Yeah. Um, and really it was just when I started working on Pearson, I just, I, I just, really felt like, oh gosh, like this seems really out of whack that we just, you know, you read it in a property class. So then you just assume, yeah, the fox is property. Nobody cares about the fox. It's just killed. That's it. You know? And I did have a student once in one of um, classes that I was teaching and it was actually my colleague's property law class. And she put her hand up and she was like, well, what about the fox? Like there's one guy who's saying it's his, there's another guy who's saying it's his, but, and I really kind of, it was a kind of a real moment for me where I thought, you know what, like, she's totally right. I need to just start to take this on board and figure out what, what to say about it. And then if this case is going to continue to be taught because it is so popular, so I don't think there's any way you can just get rid of it. Yeah. At least you could maybe infuse it with some acknowledgement of the violence, some problematization of the property status, I think that that would be actually a really cool, it could have a, it could have a new life in that vein. And I think that that would, that would be a lot better than how it's been used 
you know, in these previous generations. Mm -hmm. Okay, we have another question. U.S. courts in the non-human rights projects cases, like the justice case, et cetera, have signaled that they want guidance from legislatures in this arena rather than to exercise their common law authority. Um, sounds like climate change uh, litigation as well. Um, is your sense that this needs to be addressed legislatively rather than judicially? Do you think language like that in France and Quebec that you mentioned will eventually translate into on the ground changes for animals? Yeah, absolutely. Like, I really think legislative change is super, super important. And they're like, you know, if you look at something like Proposition 12, you know, I mean, if, if, the, if the majority of people are telling you that they want something to be a certain way, I think law usually just kind of follows along. Like I know law can be trailblazing and lead the way. And in that sense, you know, I think as an academic, from a scholarly perspective, we kind of feed that end of things, right? Like we're like, okay, well, here's a way of thinking about this that can open up more possibilities. And, you know, but really um, judges are not going to generally speaking, do things that they think are radically out of step. I mean, the most that they'll ever do for you probably is write a good dissent and a really good, powerful dissent can be amazing can be very inspirational, could eventually become law. And like I mentioned, that Lucy dissent is really, it's probably the most powerful thing we have on the Canadian, you know, animal law landscape to use as a, as a text. But the thing is that, um, you know, that, that, um, that recognition, that signaling that people are going to be giving through their on the ground activity and proposals, including legislative proposals, I think it's, it's I think it's key because otherwise, the assumption will be, well, then you're fine with the status quo, you know, if you don't think that there's a problem with it. And then it, it really does kind of come back to this point, just talking about my own personal um, kind of trajectory with this is that, you know, the fact that people don't really know. So if people don't really know, then they don't really understand, hey, you know what, this is actually something that really does need to be prioritized. And we need to be, um, you know, doing, doing whatever, 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 pulling whatever lever that we think we think could work. You know, which I think we are seeing now with environmental initiatives a lot, actually, because people are, it's really coming home to them. They're like, oh my gosh, I can't drink my tap water or, you know, yeah, make Lake Erie into a legal person. If that's going to help protect the quality of the water that I'm getting out of my tap, you know, I think people will really go for it. The problem with animals is that it's, they're always kind of um, so hidden and what's happening to them is not, is not known. It's sort of like another version of their immobilization actually. And, you know, the more I kind of work in this area, the more I think that the, that the harm, that, that is, that is what, what the central kind of harm is in a way it's, 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 it's treating a being who's supposed to be moving and preventing them from, from doing that in, in, in this, in this horrible way where you think, you know, arguably they'd be better to not be alive at all than to, than to be living like that. So, but if you can't see that, or if exposés show you that, but they show you it in a way that is like, is too upsetting. And so it overrides, you know what I mean? Your, your ability to respond or react, then we're kind of stuck, you know? And I think, I think that's a little bit what maybe Delcy was referring to there too. And the question is this sort of like, we feel very stuck. And, you know, as a, as a academic and as somebody who's interested in theory and in history, I feel like a lot of the stuckness has to do with inheriting these very strong binaries, you know, like between property and person or between rights and welfare. And they just kind of immobilize people because you go, oh, are you, are you a welfare person or are you, are you for rights? And, and then there are these divisions and then you don't, of course, you're not going to get anywhere because everybody's like mad at each other. <laughs> so, you know, so it's like, it's, 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 there's a, but I think a lot of that is born out of the frustration with being stuck, you know, and seeing things not, you know, maybe in some ways get better, but in a lot of other ways get worse in terms of numbers of animals killed and how they're being killed. And during COVID, you know, we saw with all the ways of, um, of getting rid of the animals that um, they couldn't, they couldn't process through and so on. So it's, it's, um, you know, it's, 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 pretty, it's a pretty bleak landscape. And I think as somebody who's trying to do something to help, I really think, you know, 
it's not really my job to go number one legislation, number two judge, number three. Like, I feel like everyone should just do what they can do, like what they, what's in their skill set, what's in their bailiwick and what they have access to. And then, you know, this idea that, well, there's just serendipity involved in terms of what might work and what might not work. Who knows, right? So, you know, let's just kind of go for it, you know, and I mean, certain things that have had enormous impact. I don't think anybody would have been able to predict, um, for instance, you know, that the um, Blackfish movie would result in bans on cetaceans and zoos and in, in that whole industry basically getting like becoming obsolete. Um, but that's what happened, you know, or that's what that's what's in the process of happening. So yeah, so I think that that's that's a very important um, thing to keep in mind is just um, yeah, like these the impact could be can be happening on many multiple different different fronts. I think it's really interesting to think about what you said about um, Pearson v. Post and the dissent and how it was humorous and how you know that may have something to do with why it's taken on such importance um, in legal teaching at least, but also in, you know, just how we think about property law in general. And that can be a source of inspiration to, you know, the idea that like cases can take on a different life long after the fact, you know, that dissents can become powerful down the road. Um, most recently in the um, West Virginia the EPA case, which is the big climate change case that was recently decided by the Supreme Court and was fairly devastating for environmentalists, Justice Kagan, uh, as she often does, wrote a very spirited and um, accessible and funny dissent um, that I found to be one of the more useful things coming out of the decision. And it, and it is sort of heartening to think about the fact that, you know, she, she probably writes with that tone for a reason, you know, there's probably some strategy involved in that and that um, maybe it's not a total waste. Maybe something will come of it down the road. Yeah. yeah, no, and I think it's great to think of the solemn foolery being used and turned to progressive ends and especially, you know, for women and women judges to be doing it because... I think, you know, the other object of a lot of that legal solemn foolery were women as well as non-human animals, you know, like I dug up a lot of examples of that, actually. So it was kind of like the things that socially at the time were okay to joke around about were yeah. the things to get joked around about, you know, um, but to, I think, um, you know, appropriate that and and redirect it is, I think that's wonderful. I think that's great. And in fact, I, I did a one of the feminist um, judgments rewritten. I don't know if you guys know about that project where it's like rewriting famous um, no. Supreme Court decisions and basically like trying to write them from a feminist perspective. And the property collection, they were like, oh yeah, yeah, we'd love to have one on Pearson. So basically I did that. I rewrote it, but I used a jokey tone because I didn't want to I didn't want to lose that aspect of it, you know, and I thought that, yeah, this will make it more interesting for people to read. And it'll also pay, it'll also draw attention to the fact that, you know, this is something that was often, you know, being done, but, but being deployed on, on both women and non-human animals as well. So yeah, that seemed like that was, that was important, but, you know, for me, like as a historian, because my projects just, like kind of like, I'm like this, this, this you know, it, it, it'll, it'll, I, I really have to see like what's in there. And then depending on what's in there, that's, that's what I'll, I'll dig. Mm -hmm. And maybe something that I might want to get into might not really be very well represented. And then I'm kind of, I'm kind of stuck, you know, yeah. but you know, like, you know, it's a process and, and this fishing case, you know, I had been struggling with this book project because, um, I couldn't really figure out how to talk about the fish in a way that was not consistent with how people in the 19th century saw the fish and even today how we see fish, which is really just not very important entities. You know, like we don't even count them individually when we say how many are killed in a year, right? It's like, they're very, very low on the, on the totem pole. And, but now I'm thinking I've kind of digging around a bit more and realizing, oh, there's a conservation movement that's really starting to happen around the same time in the 1890s. And there's um, a case involving fur, fur, fur bearing seals that is being uh, talked about at the same time. And the seals are getting some attention because they are a charismatic species that people can kind of rally behind. And so just then I can kind of juxtapose 
the seals with the fish and then that will allow me to kind of get this point out but um but it, but it is it's, it's challenging sometimes because you're trying to figure out like how to how to you know how to how to how to bring in the things that you know or like that I feel are very important to 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 be in there right that entry point yeah Okay, well, we are out of time. Um, so thank you so much, Professor Fernandez, for your presentation today, and for the discussion. And thank you, everybody, for joining us today. Our next talk will be this Thursday online, and we hope you'll join us. See you later. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much.